All right, so we have two chapters this morning. Um, chapter three, <clears throat> I think will be fairly familiar to you. Chapter four is a little more conservative. Some of you may find it spot on. Others may be spurred to some comments. Uh, I have built time into the presentation to allow for comments after each slide. So don't feel like you have to wait until the end. If there's something that strikes a chord with you and you, you really feel the need to make a comment, please do, because that'll just make everything go much better today. Chapter three is titled Knowing and Being Known. So Packer asks a question at the beginning of the chapter, what were we made for? Does anybody, uh, maybe who hasn't read the chapter, just have anything to say about that one? What, what, yes, Tom. Yeah. You know, and after I did this, I thought, I really should have just put that in there, put that slide in there from the Westminster Confession. Yep. So let's see what Packer has to say. To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. This is the eternal life. That we may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And he also has a question, what aim should we set ourselves in life? And this is his answer, to know God. Knowing and being known. What is the best thing in life? Bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Knowledge of God. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts about this, boast, boast about this, that he understands me and knows me. And that's from Jeremiah. Anybody have anything to say about Jeremiah in that chapter? What of all the states of God ever sees man in, gives God most pleasure, knowledge of himself. I desired knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, says God, from Hosea 6.6. 6. Now that, I think uh, Packer is not using the ESV, obviously, because this book was written in the early 90s, or updated in the early 90s, and that may be from King James. So you may have a different version in your Bible. Okay. Does anybody have a different version? What's the, anybody have ESV? What's the ESV say? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. Also, let me, let me just point out, all these slides are direct quotes from Packer's book, so it's not my paraphrasing anything, it's directly from his book. We must first say that knowing God involves first listening to God's word and receiving it as the Holy Spirit interprets it in application to oneself. Second, noting God's nature and character as his word and works reveal it. Third, accepting his invitations and doing what he commands. Fourth, recognizing and rejoicing in the love that he has shown in thus approaching you and drawing you into divine fellowship. So there's some doctrinal things in there. Listening to God's word, right? That's some of the, you know, if we kind of summarize our faith, like the word, sacraments, prayer, congregation, Fellowship, <clears throat> receiving it as the Holy Spirit interprets it. So if we're reading something, the Holy Spirit is the one who has to help us understand the word. Noting God's nature and character, his attributes. 
accepting his invitations and doing what he commands. Recognizing and rejoicing in the love that he has shown and thus approaching you and drawing you into divine fellowship. So it's a very uh, Calvinistic theology right there. The idea that God is the one who is acting on us and not the other way around. Knowing Jesus. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. From John 14, 9 and 6. First, his presence with the Christian is spiritual, not bodily, and so invisible to our physical eyes. Second, the Christian, building on the New Testament witness, knows from the start those truths about deity and atoning sacrifice of Jesus, which the original disciples grasped only gradually over a period of years. And third, that Jesus' way of speaking to us is now not by uttering fresh words. So that's a, that's a, a great quote, that first one from John 4, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. Any comments on that? On the whole slide. Thank you. Yeah. I, I've, I've been reading some, uh, some essays recently on something called the New Apostolic Re Reformation. And it's a very controversial, probably unbiblical movement going on in Christianity today. And that last sentence really, really kind of hits that. That Jesus' way of speaking to us now is not by uttering fresh words. So in other words, this new apostolic reformation is restoring the office of prophet and apostle. So these people are claiming that they're getting new revelations about the Bible, and then they're, they're speaking about that. But we know that everything that's been revealed has already been revealed in the Bible, and that's it. There's no new, there's no new revelations. It's all right there. We don't need new interpretations or new revelations. Right. Yeah. Solomon knew that. <laughs> yes. That it says Jesus is the Uromni as well as all the way around Revelation. And don't add, don't take away. Right. Yep. But rather by applying to our consciences those words of his that are recorded in the Gospels together with the rest of the biblical testimony to himself. The Jesus who walks through the gospel story walks with Christians now, and knowing him involves going with him now as then. Jesus' voice is heard when Jesus' claim is acknowledged, his promise trusted, and his call answered. So I'm going to go back to the other slide. Uh, almost all the way down, <clears throat> knows from the start those truths about the deity and atoning sacrifice of Jesus, which the original disciples grasped only gradually. You know, it's, it's common for some people to say, well, I wish I was around, you know, when the disciples were alive. It would have been much easier to believe in Jesus then because I would have seen him and, um, you know, heard his words directly from him. But, you know, if, we, if we've look at the disciples, they didn't always believe him, and they didn't always understand him. So I don't know that that would have been much better. I think we're in a much better situation because we have the whole canon of Scripture to look at. 
they only had the Old Testament and three years of Jesus, and we've got, you know, 2,000 years. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. You know, when you think about what happened Easter morning, where were the disciples on Easter morning? We just went through this in our Matthew class last week. They were nowhere to be found. <laughs> they, were, they ran and hid. A personal matter. First, knowing God is a matter of personal dealings. It is a matter of dealing with him as he takes knowledge of you. Knowing about him is a necessary precondition of trusting him. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? So what do you think about that second phrase? It is a matter of dealing with him as he takes knowledge of you. Yes. Right. Yeah. But what do you think about as he takes knowledge of you? Because it almost sounds like he's learning about us. Does God learn anything about us? Yeah. You know, when I read that, I'm like, I'm not sure if that's the best wording that he could have used in the book to express that idea. Second, knowing God is a matter of personal involvement. It would not indeed be a fully personal relationship otherwise. To get to know another person, you have to commit yourself to his company and his interests and be ready to identify yourself with his concerns. Third, knowing God is a matter of grace. It is a relationship in which the initiative throughout is with God, as it must be. Since God is so completely above us, and we have so completely forfeited all claim on his favor, we do not make friends with God, God makes friends with us, bringing us to know him by making his love known to us. They know him by faith because he first singled them out by grace. So that's another good summary of maybe the order of salvation, so to speak, the order of salutus. It's all, it's, it starts with God. Yes, Tom. Is there any, does anybody have a problem with that type of relationship, that friend relationship? Because it can go in, it can go in an extreme view. What, what are you thinking, Tom? I'm thinking that um, too many people think of him as a, as a friend that's all through their book list that will do, give them anything they want. Yes. And this is not really a relationship between equals. You are you are dealing with uh, something so much greater than yourself in that, and have to remember to recognize that. Yeah, it, it's a s- slippery slope. Um, you have to be careful. I mean, friend, sure, but friend, this friend, is in charge. 
like you said, not an equal. And the Lord said to Moses, I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They shall never perish. So these are very comforting quotes from the Bible, from Exodus 33 and Jeremiah and John. Formed you in the womb and knew you before you were born. So yesterday I was in my uh, Fellowship of Christian Peace Officers Bible study that I'm a member of, and it's mostly retired police officers from Baltimore, Baltimore County, Harford County, and one of the men in the group <clears throat> who was struggling with some issues and made mention that, you know, hopes that God has a probation department because of all the things that he's done wrong and uh, recounted times in his life where he was faced with a choice and he chose the right thing, but he could have easily chosen the wrong thing and it would have completely altered his career and his life and that God's will, you know, was probably written in pencil, so God could, as he goes along, God could just erase some things and write in what was happening. And I, you know, I pointed out to him, it's really a question of how much sovereignty are you willing to give to God? Because he's either sovereign or he's not. He either has a will for you, and it's, you know, for ordination, predestination, or he doesn't. And we're just left at the whim of all of our desires. So for God to know you before you were even born, he set you apart. Speaks counter to what that man was talking about. And I tried to give him some, some comfort in the fact that, you know, God's, God's got a plan and it's all coming out according to his plan, not yours. What matters supremely, therefore, is not, in the last analysis, the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. That's could have been right out of Calvin's Institutes talking about the perseverance of the saints right there. And I think Packer was a strong Calvinist, as we'll see later in chapter 4. This is momentous knowledge. There is unspeakable comfort, the sort of comfort which energizes, be it said, not enervates in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me in love and watching over me for my good. There is, certainly, great cause for humility in the thought that he sees all the twisted things about me that my fellow humans do not see. So here again is that idea that God is taking knowledge of me. And I'm just not sure what he's getting at with that. Does anybody have any ideas? We talked about this a couple slides ago. I just don't see how God is, is learning anything. You know, he already knows it all. So I'm just, you know, I'm not sure. He, he, and he doesn't really explain this, any, this thought any further in the book. There is Yeah. I was thinking better would be using the knowledge of me in my life. You yeah. know, yeah. he knows us through and through. Yeah. So instead of, he doesn't have to take it from me, you know, and learn it mm -hmm. about me. He knows me, but he's using what it is about me. Yeah.
Maybe it's just an expression from, from the time when the book was written. Yeah, Dan. Mm -hmm. And that the opposite of a friend is an enemy. So he's not our enemy. You know, yeah. even as you know, as your friend, he knows he he calls you friend yeah. first. Did you had a question or a comment? Good point. Thanks. Okay, on to chapter four, and I will describe this as the meat of the, of the book. Um, you know, I thought about the slides I was going to make for this chapter, and I thought I could probably do it in one slide. And I'd have that circle with the line through it that you'll see, like, you know, no left turn or no right turn or, you know, something like that, with the word images in the middle of it. And that would be the one slide, and I could, that would cover the entire chapter. <laughs> but I didn't do that because we have an hour, and you know we'd be do we'd be done at ten o'clock. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> because we have another half an hour, I have more slides. <laughs> what does the word idolatry suggest to your mind? Look at the second commandment. It runs as follows: You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or on the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. From Exodus chapter 20. So Packer, if you haven't realized yet so far in your reading of the book, is very conservative when it comes to the second commandment. And he did receive some backlash for that. And he wrote at the end of the chapter some notes uh, commenting on people that were pushing back on his stance. So what is, let, let's talk about idolatry. What, what do you think idolatry is? Yes. I have great trouble with that very image on Second Chronicles 20 as I wrote it. And I really felt that it sort of points almost uh, directly to something that God gave us as a gift and making it into something evil. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be very careful about that because there are times when an image not being worshipped Worship is not a good thing. That's a, that is, and, and I understand why 
we don't have witnesses in, in the church. Um, we have no faith in the Catholic Church in that way. Who is going to get stories from the pastor? You know, mm-hmm. since we didn't have anything in front of us at the time I was there, so everything was in front of us. And, uh, the only thing I had was what you would have in a situation like you would have in an emergency, where you have a, a non literate uh, congregation. Have you read all of chapter four yet? Have, have you read chapter four yet? Okay. Okay. So there may be some more slides that you want to comment on, and, and I welcome you to make comments. Yes. Anybody else? Years ago, I remember hearing a kind of report from, um, I think it was a youth group that was in London, and um, part of their London tour was visiting a, and I think it maybe was a Hindu temple or something there. But they walked in there, and they saw Donald's Big Mac and put them in front of this and what they saw was wilted lettuce mm-hmm. and uh, old uh, tomatoes and things like that and that, that was such a, you can tell it stayed with me yeah. with my head, it wasn't idolatry well that suggests to me uh, real idolatry and even uh, worship uh, Mary of what uh, uh, of, of an idol a graven image mm-hmm. Accordingly, we take the second commandment as, in fact, it has always been taken, as pointing to the principle that, to quote Charles Hodge, idolatry consists not only in the worship of false gods, but also in the worship of the true God by images. In its Christian application, this means that we are not to make use of visual or pictorial representations of the triune God or any person of the Trinity for the purposes of Christian worship. The danger in images. Historically, Christians have differed as to whether the second commandment forbids the use of pictures of Jesus for purposes of teaching and instruction in Sunday school classes, for example, for instance. And the question is not an easy one to settle. But there is no room for doubting that the commandment obliges us to disassociate our worship, both in public and in private, from all pictures and statues of Jesus, or Jesus Christ, no less than pictures and statues of the Father. So there is a film, and I believe it was called The Passion of Christ, produced by Mel Gibson. I haven't seen it, and I don't want to see it, because it's just from what I've heard of, it's pretty gruesome. But the actor that portrays Jesus is Jim Caviezel, who himself is 
uh, openly confesses to be a Roman Catholic. Um, I saw an interview of him when he was talking about his role in the movie, and he, he believed that he was actually taking on the suffering and passion of Christ by portraying him in this movie. Um, it, the movie, from what I'm told, is, is very graphic. It really spends a lot of time on Jesus' injuries and the blood and being whipped and all that. And um, so Kavaiazel kind of represents an extreme view of that image. You know, by portraying Christ in the movie, um, and he, I think he really identifies himself and almost has a Messiah complex in that regard. <clears throat> so I don't recommend that movie. I've never seen it, but I've just seen trailers of it. A true image of God, wrote Calvin, is not to be found in all the world, and hence his glory is defiled and his truth corrupted by the lie whenever he is set before our eyes in a visible form. Therefore, to devise an image of God is itself impious, because by this corruption his majesty is adulterated, and he is figured to be other than he is. So if we think about, uh, you know, maybe there's some children's Bibles, and, and they might have a picture of Jesus talking to the little children. And, you know, we don't have any pictures of Jesus. There weren't cameras. There weren't paintings of him when he was walking on this earth. So for us to even try to conceive of what he may or may not have looked like is, is you know, beyond our imagination. We shouldn't even be thinking about it. As Packer has pointed out and Calvin points out, we could not capture what he truly was in human form or in, in his divine form. Images dishonor God. The heart of the objection to pictures and images is that they inevitably conceal most, if not all, of the truth about the personal nature and character of the divine being whom they represent. To Aaron, or to illustrate, Aaron made a golden calf, that is a bull image, and Aaron's image hid Jehovah's glory. Whatever we may think of religious art from a cultural standpoint, we should not look to pictures of God to show us his glory and move us to worship. For his glory is precisely what such pictures can never show us. In Isaiah 40:18. After vividly declaring God's immeasurable greatness, the scripture asks us, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? The question does not expect an answer, only a chastised silence. So what of images in churches? Lutheran churches have stained glass windows. There's even some... Presbyterian churches that still have stained glass windows. They might have, uh, I think, Pre 10th Presbyterian has gargoyles in the front. And they were, I think at one time, gar gar or gargoyles were thought to be protecting the church from evil beings. So, and then, you know, of course, in Roman Catholic churches, there's stained glass. There's a crucifix, <clears throat> which is the cross with Christ still on it. I'm not sure about any other uh, church denominations, what they would have, but what, what's the danger of that? And you already commented about art form and telling a story, but Packer's kind of gone beyond that and says no, he doesn't even want that story told. But, but what do we think about that? Is he taking too hard of a stance on the second commandment? Possibility of worshiping 
So in the in the Catholic Church, with the crucifix, rosary beads, stained glass, what is what is the intent there? It's, it's to it really is to spur uh, a uh, recognition of what God did for us and how horrible it was. Yeah, Tom. So Stations of the Cross, if we put that in context, that, isn't that a, a Good Friday or a Monday, Thursday? That's a great book of uh, 
showing the distractions the enemy uses. That's what, yeah, Dan. It becomes the cheeseburger in the Hindu, Hindu temple wilting in front of the idols. Yeah, Packer's, Packer is very conservative, um, and he doesn't, he doesn't give us two ways to think about it, really. Pastor. Packer does get to that, and I think it's a, in the next couple slides we'll get into that, the positive and the negative, and the imperative and the penalty. Aaron, by making the image of God in the form of a bull calf, led the Israelites to think of him as a being who could be worshipped acceptably by frenzied debauchery. Again, it is a matter of historical fact that the use of the crucifix as an aid to prayer has encouraged people to equate devotion with brooding over Christ's bodily sufferings. Just as it forbids us to manufacture molten images of God, so it forbids us to dream up mental images of Him. Imagining God in our heads can be just as real a breach of the second commandment as imagining Him by the work of our hands. You know, when I, th when I read this, I thought about the descriptions of Jesus throughout the Bible in prophecy, and they're, they're, I mean, they're almost unimaginable. That They're describing things that we've never seen before, and how could we possibly in our mind conceive what this image would look like? We can't, and maybe, maybe that's 
on purpose so we don't even try to think about it, don't even try to draw it or reproduce it. In this light, the positive purpose of the second commandment becomes plain. Negatively, it is a warning against ways of worship and religious practice that lead us to dishonor God and to falsify his truth. Positively, it is a summons to us to recognize that God the Creator is transcendent, mysterious, and inscrutable, beyond the range of any imagining or philosophical guesswork of which we are capable, and hence a summons to us to humble ourselves, to listen and learn of him, and to let him teach us what he is like and how we should think of him. Thus it appears that the positive force of the second commandment is that it compels us to take our thoughts of God from his only holy word and from no other source whatsoever. I think that kind of answers your, your petitions, Pastor, about the positive and the negative of the command. The mind that takes up with images is a mind that has not yet yearned or learned to love and attend to God's word. Those who look to man-made images, material or mental, to lead them to God are not likely to take any part of his revelation as seriously as they should. The point is clear. God did not show them a visible symbol of himself, but spoke to them. Therefore, they are not now to seek visible symbols of God, but to simply obey his word. To make an image of God is to take one thoughts, one's thoughts of him from a human source, rather than from God himself. And this is precisely what is wrong with image making. So that's Moses' exposition or expounding on in Deuteronomy 4. Looking to the true God. The question which arises for us all from this line of thought which we have been pursuing is this. How far are we keeping the second commandment? You may say, how can I tell? Well, the test is this. The God, is, God of the Bible has spoken in his Son. The light of the knowledge of his glory is given to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Do I look habitually to the person and work of Lord Jesus as showing me the final truth about the nature and grace of God? Do I see all the purposes of God as centering upon him? If I have been enabled to see this, and in mind and heart go to Calvary and lay hold of the Calvary solution, then I can know that I truly worship the true God, and he is my God, and that I am even now enjoying eternal life, according to our Lord's own definition, which we read earlier. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's from John. Okay, we're done. Any other further questions, comments, saved rounds, or alibis? Tom. Um, uh-huh. Pastor. Um, in, in all fairness, and we've heard some uh, from most of the story, um, the whole big debate about art in the reform circles has, uh, has been um, has risen since the Reformation. And uh, so uh, if there is the accusation that is sometimes made, or at their age, that, uh, that sometimes people have the idea that the reform circles have been used.
eternity departed, then we are worshiping because that that is that is leading us perhaps to the next day. Uh, however, uh, there is a strong advocacy for uh, art in museums and in places where the attention is drawn to the focus of what is the painter or, or the artist studying in the painting. Thank you. All right, does anyone know what saved rounds and alibis is? I saw the pastor laughing. <laughs> Elder Osteen? It takes me back to the firing line in the Army in Navy Gym 2 when you were training with rifles. Um, and you have a uh, range sergeant who's in charge of safety on the range. And he checks safe on the right, safe, uh, safe on the left. firing line can fire. Then you aim at your target and you, and, you, um, and you do the best you can if you can even see the target. Um, a saved round would be one that when you were loading it, a little maybe fell to the ground or uh, you didn't load all the rounds when you were supposed to into a magazine and you had them in your pocket maybe or something like that. Uh, and you don't want to take a live round away from An alibi is an excuse. An alibi is perspiration rolled into my eye and I couldn't and I couldn't see. Or a bug was hassling me right on the firing line. That's an alibi. Or I had a weapon jam. That's an alibi. And I still have a round that I haven't fired yet. So that's an alibi is an excuse. And you've taken me way back. <laughs> So would it be fair to say that not every range instructor would ask those questions? Well, kind ones would. <laughs> there might be some who's, it is what it is. You didn't get all your rounds off, that's points off, and you didn't qualify. Um, but as, so someone that likes you would ask for save rounds and alibis. And since I love you all, I asked you for save rounds and alibis. And, and seeing that you have none, we're, we're done now. We'll close in prayer and prepare for our worship.